Liverpool, a maritime city with a rich and proud history. It's without doubt uh, one of the most iconic buildings in the city. I refer to it as the Four Grace, but actually it was here before the Three Graces. Home to one of the world's greatest skylines, Liverpool boasts many architectural gems, not least 30 James Street. It's one of the first steel structures in the world to be built. The only building in the world that can actually be called the home of the Titanic because the Titanic vessel itself was registered to it. It is the White Star Line and it is on the waterfront of Liverpool and yet it was dormant for all those years. So when I was introduced to Lawrence, he was introduced to me as the person who bought 30 James Street that had been empty for 30 years and he explained to me that he was going to open it within three months. I thought this guy's got serious mental health issues because it was never going to happen. No one could make economic sense of this building to be brought back into use. That's why it lay dormant for 30 years. This was a beast. We were awakening a beast here. I remember driving past 30 James Street with Lawrence and looking at what a beautiful building it was. Designed by renowned architect Norman Shaw, 30 James Street was constructed between 1896 and 1898. Commissioned by Thomas Ismay to act as his headquarters of his shipping company, the White Star Line. Having stood proud for over 40 years, the old lady nearly met her end in 1941, when hundreds of Luftwaffe bombers dropped their incendiaries and reduced much of the city to rubble. Thirty James Street would have a special place in the hearts of locals, as it was one of the few buildings to survive the Blitz. Rebuilt post-war, she became the headquarters for the Pacific Steam Navigation Company. However, as the shipping industry declined, so did 30 James Street. By mid-century, she was nothing more than low-rent office space. I just gone bankrupt, lost everything. Um, I went to bed for three months and, and, and I was probably going through a bit of a depression. I lost many millions of pounds. I had to make sure I had the strength of character to try and support him, not only emotionally, but financially. When James Street came on, it was almost like a marriage made in heaven because James Street had this amazing story. Uh, a lot of people have forgotten about it and didn't really know what the building was. And it had lost its reason for what it was, as it was the home of the Titanic, a hugely, hugely important building. And why this amazing structure had become this semi derelict building. Well, James Street was the headquarters for the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, and most people would uh, not recognise that name, but it's the official title of the White Star Line. And this was a massive shipping organisation based here on Merseyside that stretched all around the world. So this building was the nerve centre of that massive shipping organisation. The, the Titanic, the steamship Titanic, its registered ownership was in this building. The, the actual manager of the, the ship was a man called Harold Arthur Sanderson, and he was a partner of Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the company, and this is where Titanic had a registered address. But not only was she registered here, but the actual concept behind the construction and the design those enormous ships, Titanic being one of three sisters, 
was actually conceived in this very building. So we could say this is where it all began really for the Titanic? Yes, it's where it all began and very sadly on the 22nd of April 1912 the one and last board meeting that ever mentioned the Titanic was held in this building and then Titanic as a word was never mentioned again by the company. Uh, important part of heritage to remember uh, and the first thing is is that this building has been empty for three decades. Are we prepared to allow our heritage buildings to fall into disrepair because we can't find new uses for them? And what better than Signature Living, the, the hoteliers that plan to convert this building, that they will actually turn it into a hotel. After all, the White Star Line was in the hotel business. They happen to be floating hotels, but nevertheless, they're still hotels. So there's a great linkage between the two things. Over 120 years old, the Invincible building has survived a blitz, the decline of the shipping industry, and a troubled economy. Could the tired old lady be resurrected to shine once more? Let me just stop you there. You have to understand where I am at this moment in time. That I was faced with an amazing opportunity. The problem is, I didn't have the funding, but I certainly had the desire. All I have to do is to create the story. I was really in a place of taking risks because I knew I had to take risks in order to get on. I remember the phone call and he said, meet me at 30 James Street. Surely that can't be the building he's talking about. When we turned up, there he is with the key. He said, you bought it? He said, yeah. I said, mate, are you crazy? Are you nuts? Last used as a drug rehabilitation center, the size of the task discouraged all other developers until now. I, to be honest with you, I thought it was a little bit down a bend. It was the maddest site I've ever been on. You know what I mean? It was like, really? There's a fine line between bravery and stupidity, and I don't know which one Lawrence has got. I thought he was absolutely mad. I thought this man has got serious problems in the head. Some of the challenges are like outrageous. When you stand back yourself and say, this can't be done. When we first thought to her, I won't be here long. We're in the basement, we're under two foot of water. What are we doing with this space? And he said, we, I want it to be a spa. I want the pool there, I want the showers there, I want the sauna there. And I couldn't see it. We've already got our pool, the tax that I've got in hand. I remember going down into the basement and just thinking, there's not a chance in the land this is ever going to be a spa. Thinking to myself, this is like it, an 18 month project. Right, okay, so what's the schedule? What's the plan? And he said, well, we want to open it for Grand National. So I said, okay, so that's probably the best part of 14, 15 months. He went, no, the next Grand National, which is four months time. He's lost the plot. He's lost the plot. If you just couple all the issues together at once, a hugely impossible timescale to get the building from dedilection into fruition as a hotel. A lack of funds all the way through. A conservation offset that was desperate to close us down. I put down 10% deposit with everything that I had spare. And then the owner barred me from getting in the building. So I couldn't get in the building to do valuations, couldn't get in the building to do surveys. And so I had to bribe uh, the guy who had the keys. It took me 20 pounds to do it every time I come in. And I didn't have a lot of money at the time. I really had through the dice on this one. This was the making or the breaking of me. You've just got to understand where I am now. I have put a 10% deposit down on this building. And now I'm on a plane heading for Singapore. I know this is the last throw of the dice. After this, I have no other options. And if I don't get this money across, I will lose my deposit and I will lose the building. I turned up to Singapore, got off a plane, went right into a room which is about 10 times larger than this and there were 700 Singapore investors sitting in front of me and, and I had to get up for an hour and a half and do a pitch um, and I'd never done it before, a bottle had gone and I didn't know what I was saying and I just carried on rambling on and on and on. The guy who organised this then came on after about an hour and a half and said right you've all heard what London's got to say, anyone who wants to buy put your hands up, all the rest, thank you very much, we'll see you next month. 
400 hands went up. So I'm sitting there, wow, this is, this is strange, you know. So then he says, Lawrence is now going to get it up, up close and personal, but he's going to sit in the middle of the guy. All crowd around him, you can touch and feel him, you can ask him questions. Another hour and a half went by. The guy came back on again and said, right, I want you to form an orderly queue. I'm not kidding, by the way, it's not a joke. I'm going to give you a piece of paper, write your name on the paper. When you finish on the paper, put it in a hat, queue up, and then we all pull out the names out of a hat. So the first one come along, pick the name out of a hat. I've won, stands over in the corner. <laughs> I'm like, you haven't won, I've won. You ain't won nothing. <laughs> Just think of where I've been, bust, lost everything, couldn't get out of bed. And then all these people are queuing up, so I'm, I'm getting back on the plane, I'm thinking this ain't gonna happen. And when I come back, four weeks later, I think I raised something like just shy of five million pounds. And there it was, the investment that would make or break an empire in waiting. Lawrence returned to Liverpool eager and began taking bookings for the Grand National Races taking place in April 2014. The deadline was set for Ladies' Day. Why on earth did he choose Ladies' Day? The pressure was here. Unfortunately, the funding from the investors wasn't secured until January 2014, which meant Lawrence only had nine weeks to deliver on his promise. I put a flag in the sand that we would open on the 4th of of April and now on the 28th of Jan. The build has been open for 30 years. I couldn't understand the rationale. Why would he want to put himself under that stress, both of us under that stress? Why not just have stability in our life for a while? Why do this now? To not open a room or a hotel when you promise to open a room or a hotel, especially now with social platforms, it would have been business suicide for us. But he had this insatiable desire to buy this building and I've supported him to this day, so why not do it now? I turned to my wife and said, don't speak to me for the next three months. I was running against the clock. You, you've all heard that phrase, be careful what you wish for. That's where I am now. I've been thinking about raising funds, getting the building bought, and I've never even cast a thought to what I've got to do and the timescale I've got to do it in. And so the madness begins. Five apartments and 13 suites, and a big banqueting facility with a bar. The idea is to create an amazing accommodation. It's like the forgotten building of Liverpool. It wasn't on the endangered heritage list, but I don't think it would have been long before it, it got on it. You can't get across in words the intensity on this job. It was just 110 miles an hour, constant, from 7 in the morning until 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Gruelling, absolutely gruelling. Manic. It was hectic, going into 28 hour days and stuff. 87 or 88 hours I've done one week. It's like two weeks in one. It was mad. <laughs> With my am really, just there, uh, we had to rip the whole, the whole building out from scratch. It's like a 60 minute makeover every day in there. I feel like a zombie. It's like a walk on dead by the end of the day. You were literally eating and sleeping and breathing James Street. You can set the deadline and you've got to do it. No two ways about it. My baby's about 14 months old now. I can't even remember being born. I can, it's a joke. We're at the point now of ripping out all the old office space that this building has accumulated over the years and uncovering what the building was intended to be. I've ran around like a lunatic thinking I've struck gold. He was like a kid in a sweet shop. Look what I've found, look what I've found. And everyone's going, what have you found? It's something in the safe. And I'm saying, no, 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 it's the ceiling. We didn't know this ceiling actually existed. This ceiling, we believed, was bombed by the Luftwaffe in 1941. rebuilt in 1948 and we believed it was rebuilt as a flat seal and then we found that it's the original Norman Shaw seal. The crew also uncovered the building's original columns. They'd been hidden under plasterboard for over 60 years. If you look all the way around the building, all the buildings now are new, all the old buildings were raised to the ground.
This building stayed intact. One, because of the steel columns that go right through the building, which held the building together. One of the first of its kind. And the other one was because of these tiles that are in the ceiling are fire retardant tiles. And so the fire didn't get beyond this floor. All the floors beyond were burnt away. The building's rich history intrigued Lawrence. It sent him on a quest to find out more. I then started unearthing stories about this building, about the Cunard, about this amazing rivalry between these great companies that actually become world dominant leaders. It's really strange that these two buildings actually become so dominant that they brought Liverpool to be the second city. And in 1934, the two companies amalgamated uh, because their business was shrinking. And as they went through their demise, so did Liverpool. I always thought that was a really interesting and intriguing part of how companies can push a city up and also when they go down, cities go with them. So I wanted to sort of import that data, if you like, and reintroduce it to uh, what happened in James Street. Realising the historical importance of the building, Lawrence had decided stories of the past would set the theme for the hotel. Each floor would represent various characters, ships, and destinations associated with the building. We often refer to 30 James Street as the old lady, but I never realised how cantankerous she was going to be. I don't think anyone can put into words just how difficult this whole process of getting 30 James Street back into use as a hotel was. There are a lot of grey areas with buildings such as this that conform to be hotels and what you can and can't do. This has got issues with heritage and one main thing is this vaulted ceiling stayed as it was intended. Restoring a listed building meant heritage and conservation committees were heavily involved in the process. We want to jump in where there's value, and where there's value is where people don't want to go. People don't want to go where there are too many people who have a word to say. Fire officer, health and safety, building control, conservation, heritage, planning, financing. While Lawrence's goal was to ensure the building's structural integrity was maintained, he also had to shoehorn a hotel into an office building. I think there's a thin line uh, between heritage, conserving buildings for generations to come. It's what I stand for, it's what I believe in. But I believe in new uses for these buildings because these buildings, they can have the same DNA, but they can't have the same use because that use is no longer there. Lawrence had to juggle around plans to make economic sense of the project. He wanted to build Liverpool's first rooftop bar and restaurant in the old caretaker's quarters. However, he had a fight on his hands. There was people in the council who were behind us, but there was this one guy in the conservation officer who just put walls up in front of us, everything we done. When I say he didn't like Lawrence, that's a bit of an understatement. He absolutely had uh, it in for us. We tried to close down three times. On this one time, he did close us down. He had two officers with him with warrants put me under some kind of arrest, and he wanted me to basically say, this was all down to Lawrence. So I never said that, you know, I just, I let him do what he had to do. By nine o'clock the next day, we were open again, probably under men, working tirelessly again. Lawrence actually worked on the site himself. He owned the company and he was working alongside the lads. Take that ring off yeah. and just take this so it's, it's right up. The first time I met him, I didn't know he was the boss. He was just like a fella in an IV, just doing labouring. Just standing there with the sledgehammer for about three hours. Lawrence was involved in everything. He was there every day. Crazy ideas, opening boxes, not knocking once in there and go, ah, a wing off an angel. I know what I'll do with that. I'd be off. You'd walk into a room the next day and go, Oh, there's the wing off the angel up there on the ceiling. He sets by example. I know that anything he asks anyone to do, he's done it himself. There'd be two guys at the end of a wardrobe who'd be struggling up the stairs. I'd push them both out the way and get it myself. And then I'd run back down the stairs and I'd do it again. And I think that created that momentum. If that old fella can do it, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to let him make a show of me because I'm 25. And the fact that he was on site 24-7, decisions get made like that. That's going in behind the reception. One ball there, two chandeliers there. I designed on the spot. All the furniture, every single conduit, every single bit of paint was chosen by me while I was carrying furniture, while I was knocking plaster off walls, you know, over my shoulder. Just do that in pink. 
Lawrence realized early on, if he was going to meet this impossible deadline, he would have to lead the way. There's the most grueling set of stairs here, and whoever was walking up the stairs, I would run past them and slap them on the backside. Come on, let's go. And there was one day, there were two guys carrying up 25 gallon tubs of paint. And they got up one flight, and they stopped here, and they put the buckets down, and they were stood there. <sighs> and Lawrence comes in. I've come up behind them, grabbed them off them from the bottom floor, and I've ran every step of the way. These two big drums of paint, 25 kilograms each, and straight away you're thinking, he's gonna get two floors, he's not gonna last. On, hang on, hang on. And I'm running upstairs as fast as I can, and I'm dying. <laughs> he gets to the top floor with them, and he puts them down, and he never spoke for 40 minutes after it. <laughs> He'll probably tell you it was 20, but it was 40. <laughs> and the guys come really on. <sighs> and I'm going, <laughs> my lungs are going to explode, you know, but that was the, that's what we had to do every single day. If anyone was caught standing around, not taking part, you know, they didn't last long. He sacked me in the first couple of days. I was cutting out today, data, and he was standing there holding the pipe behind me, which he had to be there. Lawrence just come in, looked, and then looked again, and then just went, what are you doing? He told me to get off the job, and I made it to, like, the fourth floor, and got told to get back up. I remember him um, one of the lads, Dean, he was here, uh, they were working outside on a Saturday. He was washing the cars with the hose pipe outside. I think they'd been like mixing concrete or something and the cars were covered in dust and Lawrence had come around and thought he was just messing about with the hose pipe and sacked them. When he got found out the story, he was back the next day and no love lost. I'm not a guy that's full of his own arrogance. I'm, I'm a guy who'll go, was it right or was it wrong? I was wrong, I'll apologise. So Lawrence blows his top, he goes sky high, but then he calms down there quick and puts his arm around just five minutes later and goes, you're all right. No, it didn't go that way. Sorry, sorry guys. Uh, my temper might have lasted for 30 seconds and then there was a job to do. Obviously Lawrence had a lot of riding on it, so he was stressed at times and he used to take it out on the lads, so I'd be behind him, giving them a hug after <laughs> making sure they stayed there and got the job done. It was like good cop, bad cop with Dave and Lawrence. I was obviously the good cop. David humanised that team and I think the guys bought into him. I'd walk into a room, I'd see a guy on the phone, I'd literally rip the phone out of his hand and I'd throw it away and I'd say, get out, off. And I'd be really aggressive. I felt so strongly about this time scale like where to get to. Little did I know, but I did find out later that Dave would be up behind me. You know, he didn't mean it. You know, he's a nice guy, really. You, you know, he's all right, you know. D don't walk offside. And the amount of guys that he stopped from walking offside. Being heavily involved throughout the entire process meant Lawrence was under extreme pressure 24 hours a day. Keeping things together as the deadline grew near would prove to be a difficult task. I remember um, being in the site office and health and safety had brought a picture to Dave over. And he gives me this A4 piece of paper, which is a printed photograph of a guy with a high vis on, sitting on the apex of the roof, eating a sandwich. And Dave's kicking off, fuck this, who's this? And I've gone over to Lawrence and I've gone, look at that, some dickhead stood on the roof there, sat on the roof, eating a sandwich, right over, like, you know, look, he's got a eight, nine story drop, either side of him. I'm gonna fucking swing for him and find out who it is. Sheepishly puts his chin on his chest, lifts his head, and I says, that was me, that. I I'd take my sandwiches and eat them on the roof, but I wouldn't really eat them. But I'd just go somewhere for this bit of peace time. Everyone on this site was getting direction from Lawrence. So he was getting peppered constantly all day. And then I joined as the managing director. Pretty much we had six weeks for me to do what I needed to do to get the, to get the hotel open. Generally hotels take about six months and that was a full recruitment of the team, every chef, front of house staff, general manager, housekeeping staff. In the office it was hard in a sense because you're selling something you haven't seen yourself. You're on a phone to someone and you're taking their hard earned money and you're asking them to give you sometimes in excess of a thousand pounds for rooms that you haven't seen. But you can picture them in your head and you know they're going to be great. Before I joined I was told uh, you're going to be opening a 63 bedroom hotel. Um, where I've worked in the past it was all big numbers, big bedrooms so to me a 63 bedroom hotel was, uh, was, going, to be, uh, was going to be a breeze um, and then realised the week before uh, we opened it wasn't going to be. 
um, and it was going to be a bit different and you're going to need a bit of a personality and a sense of humour to get through it. My job was to leave from the front with the operations and the sales team. And I'm worried because the more people we're recruiting, the more the costs are going up, the deadline's coming nearer, and are we actually going to meet that deadline? Although still a building site, Lawrence was eager to offer a sneak peek of their progress to curious members of the public. Lawrence came and spoke to me and said, look, we're going to do this open day, but we're going to open the main hall up, we're going to have our plans up, and we're going to invite everybody around. Well, in Liverpool today, queued for the first glimpse inside the newly renovated headquarters of the White Star Line, the company that owned the Titanic. The Grade 2 listed building at 30 James Street is currently being transformed into a hotel and apartments. First time was open to the public in its entire history, 1896 to, to like 2014. When we done the open day, there was 3,000 people who queued outside the door, around the building either way, and met each other around the other side. There was just these rows and rows of people outside, and when we opened the gates, there was cheers. There was cheers from the people of Liverpool that we, that we were bringing this old, iconic building back to life. You could see the sheer delight on everybody's faces just to see the Grand Hall. The police actually came in to see me. This is getting out of hand. We're having to close roads off because of the number of people here. And it was then you realised, well, hang on a minute, you know, you start getting the, like them bad shivers. And you think, you, we've got something here, this is special. Their uncle worked here, their father worked here, their grandfather worked here. And now they could actually walk in here because they were never allowed to walk in. So those sorts of little things actually are the conduits to making sure that these buildings reach out to the public. And I think after the team seen how important this building was to the people of Liverpool, that gave them that extra bit of desire to get this done. Opening the building to the public highlighted the importance of the resurrection to the community. For Lawrence, it was imperative. Now, more than ever, he did not let them down. Completing this project in an impossible timescale would take more than just hard work and long hours. It would require a dedicated team of professionals who believed in Lawrence and his vision to resurrect this building, even if the process involved some unconventional methods. We couldn't get the floor to take away this white tone, so I came up with this stupid idea of putting a baby lotion. I can think of better reasons for baby lotion, but anyway, me and Dave Halewood, who was the site manager, uh, rubbing baby lotion into the floor and the steam coming off Dave Halewood's head, you know, and I turned to my gun. How did we end up here? <laughs> Putting baby lotion into the floor at 3 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, we carried on, we'd done the whole floor, we got it all done. And then we're back on the job the next day. I didn't have to ask David to do that. And because he did, then he did. And because he did, then he did. And then before we knew it, there was this us against the world type scenario. We've got to get this done. When I seen the drive and what we have to do for it, then I started to believe in it myself. His desire and his passion and his will to get things over the line, they just run through the DNA of the business, and it's infectious. You've got to admire his drive and his enthusiasm and the love of the city, that's what I liked. The idea that things were coming back to Liverpool. You can take a lot from him, you know what I mean? He's had his ups and his downs in his life, and uh, to come back and create what he's created now, and to be where he is now, it speaks for itself, and you don't get there by sitting on your ass and doing nothing. The inspiration that he shows to everyone, he creates a team spirit that is almost unbreakable. He walks into an empty, derelict, stinking old room and sees something no one else can see. And you've just got to go behind him and go, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's literally what we've done. He's kept me going. He's kept all the lads going. What he's doing for the city is unreal. When you work for other companies, you'll run through a brick wall for them. But I think in this company, people literally would stand in front of the bus for Lawrence. You know the day destroys the night, night divides the day. Try to run, try to hide, break on to, to the other side. Wherever you went, there was just a, a rotation of people. You know, a gang of up to 60, 80 men at times. It's just like ants with leaves. 10 men in there, 10 men in there, 15 fellas working in the corridor. We were due to hope we still didn't have any boilers in. We had to ring round and for a temporary boiler supply. Up until the last I would say 12 hours of, of opening, we were still commissioning the boiler. You were putting skating on 
And the painter was literally standing behind you with his paint tub. Soon as you'd finished, he was down painting it. Everyone was just so close together. That's one floor, so times that by six. It was just, it was that manic really. The last week can always get a bit touchy because everyone's getting tired. Plumbers want to kill the plasterers, the plasterers want to kill the labourers, the labourers want to kill everyone, the sparks have had enough. There was an intensity on that site where no one was stopping. Everyone was just climbing over each other to do stuff, to get their jobs done. No one wanted to be the one to let the job down, so everyone was just racing, you were just getting in the way of other people to get your jobs done. To not open a room or a hotel when you promised to open a room or a hotel, especially now with social platforms, it would have been business suicide for us. He didn't stop, I don't think he slept much. I remember walking in and going into the bathroom and Lawrence was sitting there on the toilet where his head in his hands, he's going to love me for saying this, two cans of Red Bull next to him, bloodshot eyes. I remember saying to him, mate, are you okay? He never said a word, just stared at me. Shook his head and put his head back in his hands. And I thought, you know what, if he's going to be like that, we've got to get this over the line for him. He never wants to let his family down. I didn't even want to go to sleep. I just was so firmly fixed on the end goal, which was to get this building open, making sure that I do not fail again. If this fails, he fails. Let me let you into a little secret. Don't think for a minute that I knew what I was doing when I took on Dirty Jane Street. I didn't have the knowledge, I didn't have the team, and I didn't have the funds. And I learned on the way. It was the toughest task. And that lack of knowledge ensured that we put down the most grueling of timescales. Everyone's running around, there's murders, there's screams, get out of the floor. There's profanities, there's all kinds of, there's murder going on, absolute murder. You come to opening day and it wasn't all rosy. People walking around thinking, oh look at these rooms. You know, we were still putting doors on. There was housekeepers everywhere making beds. We've got a reception full of guests who've been waiting for three hours getting plied with drink because we're not ready. One of our jobs in the last few days was to get the windows clean and then there was a window that we couldn't reach, we just couldn't get to it without standing outside the building basically on a ledge. I've jumped on the ledge and I'm holding the window and I'm, I'm, I'm 140 foot up or whatever it is. If I fall I'm dead and I'm grabbing hold of the window, wipe the window, grabbing hold of the window, wipe the window and I've gone right the way around the building. And I've got to one window, I put my hand through what looked like a pane of glass, but wasn't. It was empty, there was nothing there. And I lost my foot and I held on and I thought, shit, what am I doing? <laughs> That's how severe it was. Not only was it good having them on site for morale, it saved us a few bob and window cleaners as well. <laughs> I did clean a window. But the guest had to stay in a room without glass in the window. He'd opened the curtains and there was no glass uh, in the window. So what are you going to do about that? Unfortunately, nothing we can do. That's a phone from the, the yellow pages effectively to come out in there and to obviously sort the glass. The glazer comes in. 15 minutes later, guy comes down, done. 10 minutes later, I heard these footsteps run down to reception. It's him again. What's the problem? The room's not ready. Now you've told me there's glass in the window. There's no glass in the window. I think, hang on a minute, they said the glazer's just been. Takes him back up to the reception, said to Sean, Sean, has the glazer just finished the room? He said, yeah, yeah, sir. So what room was it? He said, 14. So what room are you in? In 16. So it turns out that in the end, there was no glass in four of the rooms. <laughs> April 2014. Down to the wire. Against all odds the team managed to complete the resurrection in time for opening weekend. Thousands flocked to Liverpool for the Grand National Races, and as the city sold out of hotel rooms, so did 30 James Street. It's a very, very special night tonight. We'd like to welcome on stage a young man who is quite remarkable. He is making his mark in this wonderful city. Will you welcome Lawrence? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Theatre James Street, the home of the Titanic.
the main hut was so important to conservation and heritage and probably the rest of Liverpool now in hindsight. Having seen over a hundred brides and grooms walking down the aisle, the Grand Hall is just absolutely fantastic. I don't believe that hotels should be run by bottom line. I think hotels should be run by theatre and by stories. And I think if you create enough theatre and you create enough stories, you will have enough people shared in your stories and your theatre. We had such a huge opportunity to bring back to life the story of the White Star Line. Well, you don't want to walk into a hotel and everything be the same. You want people to come in and go, I've stayed on the second floor. Next time I'll come, I'll stay on the third floor. And the next time I'll come, I'll stay on the fourth floor. We managed to secure Liverpool's true first rooftop bar, terrace and restaurant in the city. And that probably was one of the major things that made this hotel such a success because people would then go and have a drink outside on the glorious weather and see our beautiful city. There's a Milner's safe a vault in the corner, which are the same safes that were on the Titanic. Just as we were about to finish, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to open the vaulted door, go through this steel spiral staircase, and there's 3,300 square foot of swimming pool, sauna, dance floor, DJ booth, which is theirs for the night. That room gets more screams than anywhere else and gets more people taking photos, which ultimately end up on social platforms and actually becomes a beacon for us to actually take more bookings for that The idea of this being the most occupied hotel in the city was something so far away because I wasn't a hotelier. I've never been brought up and had that hotel DNA. Now it's 100% full, it's doing six and a half million pounds a year turnover. It is the most occupied hotel in the city, bar none, no one's even close to it. We have people from far and wide just walking into this hotel. I cannot tell you the amount of people who can't get into this hotel because the occupancy rates are so high, but still walk in, still want to see the White Star Grand Hall, still want to come upstairs and view Carpathia. Given that knowledge that I have now, I probably would have looked at this and said, I'm a raving lunatic. You know what, we're mad. As a business, we are mad. And we're proud of being mad, by the way. And I hope we never get away from being mad. Were we mad? Yes, we were. But did we become brilliant? Well, yes, we did, because we brought a building back into use that was never going to be used. There's nothing conventional about us. If we're going to be conventional, we might as well stop tomorrow, I think. <laughs> so to bring this building back and to use a team of Scousers who absolutely worked tirelessly to do it, it's something to be really proud of because it is a part of Liverpool's culture. To be a part of that, massive, massive professional and personal pride because everybody felt the pain together. The achievement that we've done with James Street was unbelievable. No other builder would have, would have took 12 months extra. It was the lads bonding together what got, got the job done in the end. We're all part of a team, do you know what I mean? We're all like a tent. Look around at the place and think, something I did that. I'm proud that I've resurrected the building, I'm proud that it's 100%, but I'm more proud of the workers that actually made it happen. Well, I do feel like I've absolutely left my soul in this building. This is my favourite building, and when I die, I want it on my tombstone and I get emotional when I talk about the building. Lawrence's legacy is that he wants to bring old buildings back to life. Because it was the best time and the worst time, but it's an extreme on both sides. People think that I saved 30 James Street, but actually, 30 James Street saved me.
all the kit that we took out, literally weighed a ton. And I've watched Lawrence come over to that on the floor and he's picked it up. And I don't know how, but he's got that up there on his own. It nearly killed him. It nearly ripped his chest open. I swear to God, he cried when he got around the corner. <laughs>